Good morning. This is Richfield Lutheran Church's video worship service for Sunday, September 25th. I'm Pastor Brian. With me today is Paul on the organ. Our gospel is Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Consideration of and care for those in need, especially those at our gate who are visible to us of whom we are aware, is an essential component of healthy stewardship. It is in the sharing of wealth that we avoid the snare of wealth. It is the one who, whom death could not hold who frees us from the death grip of greed. Our prelude is Chorale Prelude by Willen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is eager to forgive, who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Dear friends, let us together acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does.
God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sin is forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. O God, rich in grace, look with compassion on this troubled world. Feed us with your grace and grant us the treasure that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our gospel is Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Jesus tells a parable in which the poor one is lifted up and the rich one is sent away empty. Jesus makes it clear that this ethic of merciful reversal isn't new, but is as old as Moses and the prophets. This is the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger into water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Father Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed. So those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then, Father, I, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he might warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Father Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Father Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. This parable is a study in contrasts. We have two men, but their lot in life is about as opposite as you can get. The curtain opens with both of them lying down. The rich man is reclining to eat, as was the fashion in those days. Outside at his front gate is lying poor Lazarus. The word here is translated as lying is actually tossed or thrown. That is, Lazarus has been tossed here at the rich man's gate, tossed aside like a used Big Wrap or Big Mac wrapper from McDonald's. The rich man feasts sumptuously every day. Lazarus has nothing to eat every day. He would be delighted to lick the used napkins and wrappers tossed aside from the rich man's table. The rich man is clothed in sumptuous clothes, nothing but the finest. Poor Lazarus is clothed too, clothed in open sores, clothed with the spit of the wild dogs that lick his oozing sores. Both men die. 
The rich man is given a proper burial. Not so for poor Lazarus. And here the story turns. The angels carry him away. Now this is a reversal of fortunes. The rich man goes to Hades. Lazarus is with the angels, with Father Abraham. What is most plain about the contrast between these two men in both the before scene and the after scene is that there's this great divide between them, a, a fixed chasm that seemingly cannot be bridged. In the before scene, the rich man is somehow unable to see Lazarus, even though, well, there he is, right at his front gate. The rich man is somehow unable to reach out to Lazarus. Well, we know better than that. The rich man won't have anything to do about Lazarus. He chooses not to. We don't know why. I don't know if the rich man is greedy. Maybe he's a miser like Scrooge. Maybe the rich man is afraid of Lazarus. I mean, those people can be scary. And how about all those open sores? Maybe the rich man is afraid Lazarus' poverty is catchy. Or maybe the rich man is contemptuous of Lazarus. Perhaps the rich man would quote this proverb to Lazarus. You know, the one that says, the Lord helps those who help themselves. With its implied corollary, the Lord doesn't help those who help themselves. Maybe Lazarus' problem is his own doing. Maybe he deserves his lot in life. Say, do you happen to know where that saying is in the Bible? I mean, you'd think it's in the book of Proverbs. But you'd be wrong. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. And we would be wise to stop living as if that saying were in the Bible. So I don't know what it is with the rich man, why he doesn't reach out to his neighbor at his front gate. The Old Testament is rather clear about such things. And the rich man is a religious man, or religious enough to warrant a proper burial and to recognize Father Abraham when he sees him. Yet the rich man does not reach out to help Lazarus. In the after scene, we see this reversal of fortune. The rich man and Lazarus have traded places. And now to everyone's surprise, the rich man is in agony, tormented in Hades, while poor Lazarus is with the angels, being comforted by Father Abraham himself. In the before scene, Lazarus would have happily eaten the scraps the rich man tossed from his sumptuous feasts. In the after scene, the rich man would be delighted if Lazarus would just reach across the chasm and let just a drop of cool water land on his parched tongue. But Father Abraham says this great chasm between heaven and Hades is fixed and cannot be bridged. There is just no traffic between the two. Not even day trips, not even if you just wanted to tour the other place. You know, Father Abraham notes with irony, this chasm... Well, it's as great and as fixed as when, well, you could not reach out to help poor Lazarus, tossed aside like human refuse there at your front gate. The rich man is S-O-L. He's out of luck. In a fleeting moment of mercy, the rich man thinks of his five brothers still alive back on earth. Because unless something changes, they will face the same fate as him. Perhaps if Lazarus could go back and warn them, Please, I beg you, the rich man pleads. The rich man still doesn't get it, does he? I mean, he still looks down upon Lazarus as his lackey to do his bidding. Boy, oh boy, there's been a great reversal, and the rich man still doesn't get it. Father Abraham says, Sorry, bucko, no can do. Too bad, so sad. Your brothers have the Holy Scriptures, same as you did. The Old Testament is clear on these things, that yes, you are your brother's keeper. And if they're not going to listen to the word of God, well, who will they listen to? Father Abraham goes to note that even if Lazarus were to return from the dead to warn them as a ghost or a spirit, they still wouldn't get it. He says, no, they have the Holy Scriptures, and that's more than enough. If they won't listen to the word of God, well, they're sure not going to listen to a spirit however holy. Perhaps you remember A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Ebenezer Scrooge, that mean old miser, is visited by the ghost of Jacob Marley, his former business partner, and then by three more ghosts, 
the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Well, Scrooge is frightened by these three ghosts. He gathers his composure and says they're just humbug. Why, they're just side effects of stomach indigestion from dinner. As Scrooge puts it, you may be an undigested bit of beef, a, a blot of mustard, a, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Yet Scrooge's heart is finally cracked open when the ghost of Christmas yet to come reveals what the future holds for him and for little tiny Tim, the way things are going. Scrooge wakes from his vision, realizes it was just a dream, a, a bad dream at that, but one that deeply shook him to his core. And yet, with this new day, he has a new start. And Scrooge is a new man, which surprises everyone. Today's parable of the rich man and Lazarus reminds me of A Christmas Carol, only it was not a dream for the rich man, a dream from which he can awaken to a new day. It's too late for the rich man, too late to wake up and change. He had plenty of time to hear God's word, Plenty of time to bridge that chasm between him and Lazarus. But now, it's too late. So what is the good news here? What is Jesus up to in this parable? Is it that if we're like poor Lazarus, that then heaven is our pie in the sky by and by? Well, that's not necessarily good news for us right now. But let's be honest. Well, we Americans are more like the rich man than we are like Lazarus. If you go on the internet, you can look up something called howrichami.givingwhatwecan.com. Okay, there you go, and you can type in your annual income or type in the median income for your zip code. I don't know. Where does our neighborhood fit in the pecking order of suburbs in the Twin Cities? Do you feel rich? Maybe not in comparison to Edina or YZ, perhaps, but we're doing okay. Okay, well, go to howrichami.givingwhatwecan.com and find out where you stand in the world. I typed in the average household income for our zip code. <laughs> and guess what? The typical household here is richer than, drum roll please, the typical household here is richer than 98% of the world. Huh. That's right, our neighborhood is among the richest 2% in the world. Huh. How about them apples? I mean, even I typed in with someone just earning minimum wage. And here, even at minimum wage, they're richer than 94% of the world. We are that rich. Well, I don't feel rich. But then it's not, that, it's not that we're rich. It's that everyone else is poor in comparison. There is this disparity, this chasm between us and the poor of the world. And that is a big problem for God. As unfair and unjust as that is, and as worthy of preaching as it is, I still think Jesus is up to, up to something even more here. So what is the good news here? The grand reversal that takes place between the rich man and Lazarus from the before scene to the after scene is a central theme in the Gospels. Listen to what Mary, the mother of Jesus, sang in what we know as the Magnificat way back in the first chapter of Luke. She sang, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Now, isn't that exactly what happens in our parable here? The, the rich man was brought low and lowly Lazarus was lifted up. Hungry Lazarus was filled with good things and the rich man was sent away empty. So this aspect of the parable should not come as a surprise. Okay, well, how about that bit about the rich man's brothers would not be convinced if Lazarus came to them from the dead and warned them. I mean, that seems odd. I think I would be persuaded. But no, that too is a recurring theme in the Gospels. Jesus goes through all the countryside performing signs and miracles. He turns water into wine. He heals the blind. He walks in water. He feeds 5,000 families with two fish sandwiches. I mean, heck, he even raises three people from the dead, including one named Lazarus, not this one, but the brother of Mar Martha and Mary. I mean, you name it, he does all these signs and wonders, and how do the people respond? Well, they go, ooh and ah. And one paragraph later, it's as if they've forgotten all about it and moved on back to their life as it was before. 
And all these people who have witnessed Jesus' signs and wonders, what do they do when, on the closing chapters of the Gospels, when Pilate asks them what they should do with Jesus? And they shout out with one voice, Crucify! Crucify! And how about the disciples, I mean, who've not only witnessed all these signs and wonders, but have journeyed with Jesus the past three years? One betrays him, one denies him three times, and all abandon him. No, signs and wonders, no matter how miraculous, cannot bring people across that chasm back to God. So what is the good news here? Well, keep digging. It's here. These parables are often a, a riddle wrapped in a mystery. Here's what I think is the good news for us today. Even though Father Abraham tells the rich man that the great chasm between heaven and Hades is fixed, even though Father Abraham says that even if someone were to rise from the dead, the rich man's brothers wouldn't believe. I mean, if they're not going to believe the scriptures, they're not going to believe that either. Even though Father Abraham says the rich man is SOL, he's out of luck and it's too late. Even though, even though God does it anyway. God does raise Jesus from the dead, and he bridges the chasm between death and life and comes back and says, peace be with you. God does it anyway. God loves you that much. God will go to whatever length it takes to bring you home. Even when things look hopeless, things look impossible, plumb out of luck, God's love for you knows no bounds. If it takes Jesus' body and blood to bridge that chasm, well, so be it. Whatever it takes to bring you into the bosom of Abraham, like Lazarus here, God wants to cradle you in his arms. And if that is what must be done, since nothing else will do it, then that's what God will do for you. And because of God's boundless and steadfast love for you, as with Scrooge and a Christmas carol, you too can wake up to a new day. You can bridge that seemingly fixed chasm between you and the poor lying at your front gate. All because God is for you. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In response to the good news, we confess our shared faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As grains of wheat are gathered together into one bread, so let us gather our prayers for the Church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. O God, rich in mercy, Fill your church with righteousness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Empower the baptized by your spirit to be rich in good works and ready to share. God of grace, hear our prayer. Protect the earth and its creatures. Provide water, food, shelter, favorable habitats, especially for endangered species. Preserve threatened ice caps, glaciers, parks, and beaches. God of grace, hear our prayer. Increase justice in nations, local governments, and courtrooms. Guide lawyers and those who hold public office to act with compassion and discernment. God of grace, hear our prayer. Give food to the hungry. Set the captives free. Lift up those who are bowed down. Look over the stranger. Tend to those who are ill. Stir us to act in the best interest of our neighbors. God of grace, hear our prayer. Enliven our praise, inspiring musicians, artists, poets, and all who create beauty in this place. God of grace, hear our prayer. 
and fold the saints who have died in the arms of your loving care. Grant that the holy angels accompany us and bring us to eternal life with them in the light of your presence. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gathered together in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, we offer these and all our prayers to you. Through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You can support this and other of God's ministries through Richfield Lutheran Church today through our website, richfield-lutheran.org. Thank you for your faithful generosity. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This Sunday, September 25th, in addition to this video recording and its phone-in option, we have in-person worship at 9.30. And the choir is singing. Pastor Wegener will be preaching with an entirely different sermon from here. Afterwards, we will share fellowship in the coffee hour. Next Sunday, October 2nd, our gospel reading is Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus instructs his followers about the power of faith and the duties of discipleship. He calls his disciples to adopt the attitude of servants whose actions are responses to their identity rather than works seeking reward. Until then, go forth with God's blessing. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Go in peace with Christ beside you. Thanks be to God. Our postlude is Prelude and Fugue in G Minor by Bach. Thank you.